Exciting times have happened in the last few days. I finally bought an electric car. For those people who haven't watched my previous videos, hello, I'm Anthony. I've commissioned a nine kilowatt solar panel array in Aberdeenshire last November. And my previous videos have discussed the performance of these panels extensively. But I'm all about the wider discussion of energy saving and electric cars are a major part of that puzzle. So whilst I discuss that, I'll just tease you all with a video diary of my journey from my house to picking up my car. Well, it's the morning of Monday the 13th of September and uh, it's now time to go for a walk and pick up my new car. So I won't be uh, picking up my new car in my old car. Instead, I'm going to be picking up my new car by bus and train. So let's go for a walk. So I'll just mute my doppelganger and I'll continue on from here. So previously in May, I presented two key requirements that needed to be satisfied before I would purchase an electric car. Those requirements are that no journey time should take longer than it would in my diesel car. The second requirement is that the overall cost per mile should be no higher. Now at the time, I was anticipating buying an electric car in the year 2022, but because of rising prices, I've decided to bring that decision forward uh, to this year. Now I'm somebody who often drives 150 miles or more into remote parts of the Highlands of Scotland. As such, I need a car that can take me out there and back on one charge. I also periodically drive 600 miles south to West Sussex to visit family. So reducing journey times for me correlates to having a long battery range and fast charging speeds on the roads where you cannot uh, do the journey in one charge. So now I've sold my diesel car and that cements the cost of driving for my uh, old Volkswagen Golf as being 41 pence per mile over nearly 96,000 miles. Just over half of that cost was depreciation. But under half of that cost was insurance, diesel, maintenance, and of course, uh, vehicle excise duty. The cost of keeping it roadworthy, as you can see, has involved a lot of spare parts. Now the best choice by far would simply be to keep on driving my Volkswagen Golf. After all, the longer you drive something, the less depreciation it has to suffer. But what I found over the last 15,000 miles was a number of expensive service visits and also free unscheduled garage trips, two of them would have left me stranded if my luck wasn't so fortunate. Uh, in one instance, I had a binding brake that was uh, causing some smoke. And in the other instance, I actually had a loose wheel. So actually, the cost of driving has increased over those 15,000 miles from 38 pence per mile to 41 pence per mile. And that even takes into account the fact that the residual value of my Volkswagen Golf has increased since last Christmas. So it's clear to me that now is the time to get a new car. So what are the options? The best point to start from is the latest Volkswagen Golf, the diesel version. My old Golf was the GT. I had a number of optional extras that were spec'd in. I used the online car configurator to get the equivalent Golf variant with the same or equivalent options ticked. And the result is this. 
I got a list price for a brand new Golf that was 34 and a half thousand pounds. And that compares to a discounted price of 26 and a half thousand pounds six years ago. Supply shortages are what they are. And as a result, you're unlikely to get a discount because of those shortages. When you also add in the consideration that in six years time, fewer people are going to want a diesel car, it's likely that the depreciation curve is going to be steeper. So we can have additional assumptions about the cost of diesel, insurance and spare parts. And when you factor that all in, I'm reckoning the estimate is going to be about 58 pence per mile. That's really steep, especially considering that the mileage rate you can claim uh, from your company tax-free is still 45 pence per mile. So let's have a look at some electric car options. So the closest car to a Volkswagen Golf in electric terms is a Volkswagen ID3. And I spec'd a top range, top of the range uh, specification here. It's got a battery range of 30, 330 miles. It's got a heat pump as an optional extra. And the list price came in at just under 41,000 pounds. So, so far it's not looking too good. But the thing is, is that depreciation in my estimation, it's going to be lower. The electric cars are still going to be desirable six years from now. The first generation of the Nissan Leaf suffered a steep depreciation. Um, but now people are realizing that these vehicles are actually the cheapest batteries you can get for your house. And it just so happens you get a, a free set of wheels to go with it. So secondhand Leaf prices are holding up better now. Now, the thing about electric cars is that maintenance is much reduced. If we go back to my previous page, there's no oil change, no timing belt change, and you probably don't even have to deal with brakes because you've got regenerative braking from your motors. So brake wear is much reduced. So essentially, you've got some tires to deal with, and you've probably got some out of warranty surprises as well. Now, the quote for insurance compares very well to my Golf. And best of all, you're exempt from vehicle excise duty. You don't, you don't pay anything from one year to the next. Now, there's some assumptions I made. Um, I made the assumption that the price of electricity is 15 pence per kilowatt hour. That's probably quite a high assumption. If you own an electric car, there are cheap nighttime electricity prices you can pay, which are about five pence per kilowatt hour. But if you watched my previous video, you'll come to realize that the wholesale price of electricity is really expensive right now. And sooner or later, that's going to feed into everybody's electricity bill. Um, when you add in roadside charging every now and again, I think 15 pence per kilowatt hour is a reasonable estimate for the price of electricity. Um, now, at this stage, I'm not even considering solar power benefits. I'm just looking at uh, uh, the electricity costs that an average homeowner will have. So all of that works out as being 34 pence per mile. That's cheaper than my existing Golf. And it's starting, it, it's in the same ballpark as the Golf I got rid of six years ago. Um, so, so far, so good. But let's uh, consider a Tesla Model 3 now. This is one of the most talked about cars on the planet right now. So the long range Tesla Model 3 will cost you 48 and a half thousand pounds. Quite a bit more than the Volkswagen ID3. But here's the thing. Teslas have got a reputation for holding up their value very well. So let's assume that depreciation over six years and 100,000 miles is about 50%. But there's one big difference between that and an ID3, and that's the insurance quote that you'll get for it. 
uh, the cheapest quote I got was £637. So it's £300 more expensive than the ID3. But even with all these things considered, the cost per mile is working out as being about 35 pence. That is still cheaper than my old Golf. Now, there's one other thing I haven't considered in the cost of driving, and that's accessories. Those were built into my uh, existing cost records. Um, and when you've got an electric car, you will no doubt want an electric car charger. And for me, living in Aberdeenshire, um, I also want a set of four rims, uh, which I can use for uh, winter tires. So that's going to add up the cost. But these investments, they, they hold out. There's one other thing I haven't considered, and that's future taxation. It's all speculative, but it's worth some discussion. HM Treasury stands to lose a lot of fuel duty revenue as more people switch from fossil fuel cars to electric cars. Now, for my old car, that fuel duty worked out as costing about five pence per mile. So let's assume for a moment that the HM Treasury will need to replace that lost revenue. And there's all sorts of ways you can do it. And you also need to factor in the fact that it seems to be government policy now to encourage walking and cycling in favour of driving. So it's likely they'll either tax ownership of the electric vehicle or they're going to tax mileage in some form or another. So I've assumed for one moment that five pence per mile is the road charge that will be levied for all light duty passenger vehicles. And there's two things to note. Number one, it's still cheaper to drive an electric vehicle compared to my old Golf. And number two, it's likely that that levy will also be applied to existing petrol and diesel cars in addition to fuel duty. So what did I choose in the end? Let's have a look at where I've ended up. Now I'm wondering whether I can see my Tesla. Right, I'll just uh, switch off. So my journey towards buying an electric car, it started soon after I got my kitchen refit completed. The thought in my mind was that I wanted to get a car charger installed this year in preparation for a car purchase next year. That way, buying an electric car wouldn't feel so daunting when the time came. Now, I wanted a Zappi charger. This is made by My Energy, and I'll talk about those specifics later. Um, but on their website, I put out a request for quotation and I gave lots of information about my electrical system in my house and I received a phone call. It was a very nice technical conversation with the managing director of a company called Smarter Utility. So they came back with a quote, um, but there was a catch. In order to qualify for the UK government £350 OLEV grant and the Scottish government £250 energy savings grant, you need to prove that you've either ordered an electric car or that you own an electric car. So I chewed over this conundrum for a couple of weeks. And the thing that really spurred me into action was the fact that there were some pretty rapid price hikes for the Tesla Model 3 in the United States. Those price hikes hadn't arrived in the United Kingdom yet, um, 
but I was anticipating that they would. So I decided that now was the time to make a move. So I ordered my Tesla Model 3, and then I applied for the Energy Savings Trust grant. So I'll talk about the Model 3 ordering process later. Um, now, the thing about these grants is that it's the homeowner rather than the installer which needs to apply for the Scottish government grant. The UK government grant, the OLEV grant, uh, is applied for by the installer. So what you need in your Energy Savings Trust grant application is a written qu quote from your installer with the OLEV uh, grant subtracted from the final amount due. And that, for me, was quite a muddle in that aspect of the paperwork. Eventually, though, I got it sorted and I had my uh, Scottish grant application approved. There was one remaining problem with getting the charger installed. They didn't have any. There is a shortage of Zappi chargers. They've been affected with uh, the semiconductor industry uh, chip shortage, just like many other uh, consumer electronics. So by this time we were knocking on August and I was getting nervous because that was when my Tesla was due to arrive. Um, but I shouldn't have worried. As fortune would have it, I was given a plug-in hybrid courtesy car whilst my Golf was in for repair and a garage. It was my first plug-in experience and with nothing but a regular extension lead, um, I was quite amazed at the fact that I could get 30 miles of range out of this thing um, with just uh, three or four hours of charging. So it proved to me that you don't need a de dedicated car charger. You can get by with a regular three pin socket outlet. And that alleviated a lot of anxiety for me. So ordering my Tesla Model 3 was very easy. You just spec your car up on their website. You then enter your name, your address and your credit card details. You pay a 100 pound reservation fee. And once that's done, you choose your pickup location. Now for me, I was a bit surprised. There's a new service center in Aberdeen and I thought I'd pick up my car there. Um, but uh, the only option available was Glasgow. It turns out that the Aberdeen location will just do uh, repairs and other ancillary services on your Tesla. They don't do deliveries. So compare that experience to buying a traditional car from a traditional dealership. This process took me just 10 minutes to do. I had a cup of tea in my hand. I was in the study, uh, which you see here. There's no nonsense with trying to negotiate a discount or haggling over the provision of a tank of fuel in your tank or some floor mats. It was just very, very easy. So I placed the order at the end of June and they were targeting an August delivery. So now all I had to do was go there and pick up my new car. Right, here are my keys. Let's go and take a look. Here it is. Let's go take a look at this. Wow, it's, it's quite amazing. The, um, let me just switch on my microphone. So, yeah, we're right next to the M8 here. Um, that's where the uh, delivery center is. Um, it looks all right, that. Okay, um, it's time for me to do my checks. You then inspect the car and uh, you sign another document to say that handover is complete. Once that happens, your Tesla app 
is activated, your referral miles are activated, and you can go onto your Tesla account at that point. And one particular question I had was proof of DVLA registration. Um, all of those documents were in the te online Tesla account. So literally there was no piece of paper for me to handle. So it's quite a noisy place this. Um, it was, it is a very immaculate car. There was just one minor defect and they fixed it straight away. Just a couple of uh, fingerprints on the headliner and they sorted that out straight away. Um, so I've now got about 86% 86, 86 charge. So I am now ready to uh, finish, to uh, start my journey. The car, I went uh, around everything. Um, I had this uh, checklist, which you can download off the internet. Um, and there's been all sorts of uh, quality issues with Tesla. Uh, in the past, but I found this car to be immaculate and the buying experience uh, was really straightforward. I walked in, I was greeted, very friendly people here in Glasgow and uh, I just uh, signed on an iPad, they gave me the keys and uh, off I went. I just uh, sorted everything out myself, just get familiar with, with the controls. Uh, so uh, I'm now ready to drive home and uh, We'll see how that goes. Wow. Well, that is about just under three hours of driving from Glasgow back to my house. And it's just been a fantastic drive. The um, f driving is completely different to uh, a, a normal petrol car. You've got um, uh, one pedal driving. So when you lift your foot off the accelerator, the car will brake and it won't use the brakes it will just simply use the uh, motors as generators to absorb the energy so you recover that energy as you slow down and it's a very different experience um, it's a bit like um, it's a bit like uh, scalectrics and go-karting at the same time I can just feel that this this car just is planted on the road a lot more securely there's no body roll when you're going around a roundabout for example um, there's a lot for me to uh, discover about this car um, and right now I've got uh, a little bit of lunch to do and then it's on to uh, it's on to getting rid of my old car. This whole buying process is an example of how cars should be bought. It's almost like ordering anything else on Amazon. The only Achilles heel for me is a lack of delivery to my actual house. That's the only difference. Now, once I saw my car, it was just that realization that that car was all mine. So then I had a 160 mile journey back home. Once I got home, there was just that realization that I was going to take my golf on its final drive with me behind the wheel. So my new car and my old car. Each time I buy a new car, I always put them side, to, side by side next to each other. I did this uh, with my uh, previous uh, Volkswagen Golf and also my first car, the Vauxhall Corsa. And I've driven this car now for 96,000 miles. Mechanically, it's been superb. Um, electronically, there have been a few issues, um, but uh, it's always gotten me to where I want to go. And uh, I'd recommend this car, generally speaking, um, and I'm hoping the next uh, owner will uh, enjoy it just as much as I did. Um, it's, uh, it's always sad to, uh, to say goodbye, but um, there's, there's one more journey that this has to do uh, very soon. And uh, that will be the last journey with me behind the wheel of it. So um, once I've done that, it's time to take uh, the train and the bus back here again for the second time. And uh, then it's gonna be a matter of uh, pushing all the buttons on my new car. So later on that day, 
I took my old Golf on its final drive uh, to uh, where I was going to sell it. And I used this uh, company called webuyanycar.com. So the process of selling on We Buy Any Car was really simple. Uh, you get greeted by a really pleasant guy. He's uh, very polite and he will ask you to switch on the engine. He wants to just see that the car's running fine. He'll then walk around your car and he'll note down any defects in your uh, bodywork. Um, and he was noting all the little tiny stone chips, which I'd never really paid attention to. Eventually you get a valuation. And for me, it came down about 700 pounds below uh, the valuation I got when I entered in the damage, which I thought I had. Uh, and I remarked on that and he instantly applied a discount and the revised place price was still lower, but I decided to uh, accept it. And once I accept the price, um, you just hand over the keys and the V5 document. And then the feeling I had with getting my Model 3, I had the opposite feeling when I was just staring at my car, my, my Golf for the first time. It was no longer my car. It just felt like you just gave away a baby or something like that. And uh, it just felt a very strange experience. So um, that feeling was very brief though. Um, once I got home and I saw the money in my account, and the Tesla on my driveway, I just realized this is, uh, this is all good. So when it came to uh, my car charger, um, I needed to make some preparations. Uh, some months before the charger was installed, um, I had a trench prepared um, for the uh, charging post. Um, I used a local builder for that. Um, the quote from Smarter Utility did not include trenching work. They could provide it, uh, but they wanted a survey done first. And as soon as you include the word survey in anything, that costs a lot more money. Um, I tried to dig a trench myself, but my back wasn't up to it. So I just uh, used a local builder to do that job. So all told, the cost of installing the charger, including the grants and the trenching work, for me, it was about £1,300. That's fine. So the electrician, he arrived in the morning, he was on site for three hours, and it was really quite a straightforward task. He did some work in the consumer unit and he was wiring up the cable uh, to the uh, uh, electric car charger so it's a straightforward task the thing to note though is that that straightforward task requires some qualification some houses have electricity supplies which are not robust enough to take a 32 amp charge on top of the regular loads in their house now in the wiring regulations you've got something called maximum demand and this is a, a theoretical number and it's the maximum possible demand that you'll probably have in your house uh, in the worst case scenario now if that maximum demand exceeds 60 amps then you need approval from your district network of operator which in my case is sse networks uh, in advance of getting the charger installed uh, that didn't apply to me, thankfully. But if you do need approval, the outcome of the approval is either going to be a delay uh, in terms of uh, getting your charger installed whilst they fit, do the calculations, or in the worst case scenario, uh, the DNO will tell you that you either need your charger to be throttled and restricted in terms of how much current it can take, or you're going to need a brand new supply cable installed to your house. Now, the consequences of getting a brand new install, uh, supply cable from the street into your house, that can cost thousands of pounds, especially when there's groundwork to do. Um, in some instances, I've, I've read of quotes of 33,000 pounds. It's not a trivial amount of money. 
So it's worth doing your homework in advance of getting a, an electric car in that regards. So the Zappi charger has got a grid import limitation function. So if the import current exceeds 60 amps, um, you can configure this uh, import limitation to kick in and keep your um, incomer uh, below that threshold. I don't know if that's factored into the maximum demand calculations, um, but it is nonetheless a good reason to choose this charger. Some other chargers will be a lot more basic. So um, there's a lot of technical discussion that can be had about maximum demand. Uh, other YouTube websites, other YouTube videos uh, will discuss that in more detail. But in my situation, it was fine. So what you get with every single Tesla, type two plug on one end, three pin uh, plug on the other end. And this adapter enables you to plug in to any uh, household uh, socket outlet. And that's really fantastic. It means that wherever you go, so long as you've got, uh, in this case, I've got a, a extension cable as well, but wherever you go, um, you can charge up your car. And that's one of the major advantages with uh, electric cars. And this doesn't charge up very fast. It's 10 amps and at 240 volts, that's about uh, 2.4 kilowatts. So what that means is that it will take about 30 hours with this system to charge up your car. And it might not be very convenient. Your socket outlet may be inside your house. It is in my situation. And yesterday when I parked this car, um, I had to uh, uh, set this uh, extension cable up to go through my uh, letterbox. Um, so it's not ideal, but 30 hours of charging from uh, an empty battery to a full battery is not too bad if you consider what kind of driving uh, you're doing on a daily basis. If you're just driving to and from work, then you're getting 120 miles of charge every single night um, for 12 hours. And that's more than adequate if you're driving uh, 40 miles a day. Um, however, I went for something a bit more special uh, and quite a lot more standard. So this is a seven kilowatt charger. This is uh, a brand called My Energy. They've been around since uh, I think 2016, 2017 time. Uh, this is special because this takes surplus power from my sun solar panels and it regulates the current being delivered to the electric vehicle. And what that means is that I don't have to draw the full seven kilowatts. Um, I can draw whatever surplus power is available. In this case, um, I haven't got enough surplus power. You need 1.4 kilowatts of surplus power uh, before it delivers a charge to the vehicle. So I'm not, I'm not wasting my, uh, my time here. Um, but what it uh, uh, means is that I don't have to pay for expensive grid electricity whenever I want to charge the car. I can just plug that in and it will charge up uh, automatically regulating uh, the uh, available uh, current uh, to match the, uh, the power from the sun. So the installer came today, one day after I got my uh, electric car and uh, the uh, base that's been prepared by a local builder um, and uh, the post is uh, bolted into the uh, into the base. So in short, um, there isn't too much to do. There's three different modes. You can take the full seven kilowatts or you can use what's known as eco mode. And what that does is that it dr draws 1.4 kilowatts of power um, 
uh, as a minimum and if it has to draw some of that power from the grid then it does so. Um, what I've got here is uh, a mode it's called Eco Plus and what it does is that it requires a minimum of 1.4 kilowatts of surplus power uh, to uh, start charging the car and that means I don't have to pay for electric ex electricity which is expensive during the daytime uh, but I can also change it to the full 7 kilowatts uh, as and when I need it. Uh, now the cable this goes in this trench here. This is a unique cable. Um, in addition to uh, your usual free cores, um, there is uh, a data cable uh, embedded within here. It's a steel wire armored cable and uh, the data cable has got eight cores. It's just a Cat5 cable. Um, it goes into the house here and uh, that will uh, enable uh, the uh, charger to communicate with uh, up to four uh, current transformers. And these are um, wrapped around the grid supply cable and the solar supply cable. So with uh, the Tesla, you get an app which allows you to control the car remotely. Um, if you want to open the charge port whilst the car is locked, you just uh, select open charge port and there it is it's open so now we can just get the cable plug it in and uh, charge it up so it's quite a substantial cable uh, you just push that in take it out and that uh, triggers this to let it know that it's about to be uh, plugged in so here you've got a um, status indicator to tell you what the state of charge is so it's ready to receive the uh, plug. So we just plug it in and that's uh, the cable locked in. And uh, it's not taking any charge at the moment because we are not generating el enough electricity. Uh, when it does, then this uh, green Tesla indicator will start pulsating uh, green to say it's taking a charge. As you can see on the status indicator there, it's uh, waiting for surplus electricity. Well, it's now uh, two days later uh, since I bought my Model 3. Um, I hope you've uh, found this uh, video interesting. It's uh, very specific to Scotland, uh, the uh, buying and uh, driving experience. I'm hoping I'm going to do some more videos about the car itself and also about my uh, charging experiences. Um, I've already uh, charged up the car about 20% uh, given uh, cloudy conditions. Uh, that's not too bad. Um, so I hope to talk to you again very, very soon. Thank you for watching.